Hi, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the DMN download with the Dallas Morning News. My name is Natalie Kelmankun. I am a breaking news and curious Texas reporter at the Dallas Morning News. And today we are joined by John Slate, who is an archivist with the city of Dallas. John, thank you for being here today. Thanks so much for having me, Natalie. <laughs> of course. Um, so today you guys are going to be essentially listening to um, a conversation that I'm going to have with John. Um, I, of course, work on Curious Texas, um, and Curious Texas is a project, an engagement project with the Dallas Morning News um, that basically allows you to ask questions, and I do the reporting to find the answer. And something that I wanted to mention to you guys is that, you know, John being the city archivist and with Curious Texas questions being essentially 75% dealing with archives. John and I talk a lot um, in terms of Curious Texas stories and the city of Dallas history. So um, today we're gonna be talking about lots of different interesting things that John has come across during his time with the city of Dallas. And um, we're really excited to be here to share with you guys. And of course, we're excited to have you. So John, I wanted to talk first about how long you've been working with the city of Dallas and what you do as an archivist? Well, um, I started working for the city on uh, March 8th, 2020. Oh, nice. So this is my anniversary week right now. Oh, congratulations. Happy yes. anniversary. <laughs> and thanks. So, so 22 years and counting, and um, it's been amazing. I've, you know, had any number of different jobs, but uh, um, uh, I guess they saved this one for towards the end because it's um, it's felt like a hand in glove. It's the, the job that I wake up every morning and am really most happy to go to. Uh, but, uh, and I'm sorry, you were saying uh, what else? Yeah, um, what do you actually do as a, oh, an archivist? What do I do? <laughs> um, well, archives work involves a lot of... Um, different things. Um, it's part librarian, uh, part uh, detective, and uh, part uh, uh, conservation and preservation work. Um, uh, we do two things. Um, our, our work is pretty much divided into two uh, sorts of work, preservation and access. Uh, you have to preserve the materials to make them accessible. And the materials are no good, even if you preserve them, if you don't provide access. Mm -hmm. So uh, balancing preservation and access is really the day-to-day the -day work of an archivist. Um, uh, a lot of people like to think that we spend our time looking at cool stuff, and we do do some of that. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't, I'd be lying if I didn't say that. Uh, but um but, but really and truthfully, a lot of it is mundane work that involves uh, preparing materials for uh, citizens and other folks to use. And that includes uh, taking uh, part uh, damaging fasteners, like basically getting rid of staples and rusty paper clips and things like that. That's a kind of a, an endless task. Um, Rehousing materials, uh, uh, old documents and photographs uh, and putting them in uh, acid-free um, folders and boxes, uh, putting things like photographs in uh, mylar sleeves that keep uh, hand oils off and keep U uh, UV light from bleaching them out. So a lot of it, a lot of the little things we do are what add up to the preservation part of making uh, archives accessible. Um, but to make them really useful to people, they also need to be described. Uh, arranged and described adequately. And um, arrangement can be in mostly in the form that it originally came in. So if Bob Jones has a scrapbook that, that all the pages are in a certain order, that's like Bob Jones is telling a story mm -hmm. in the order that he wanted it in. So we wouldn't move the, the, the pages around because that would be reordering the story. Uh, but similarly, uh, that is with um, paper documents. We try not to disturb the original order if, if, it's, if there's a reason for it. Mm -hmm. um, now, if there isn't, and it just comes to us in a giant pile, well, then we get to impose a order on it mm -hmm. and try to help people make sense of it and make it useful for people. 
but uh, after the arrangement part, we try to do description and um, we need to basically tell people what is it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we have uh, what are called finding aids or guides, uh, which are basically an inventory, uh, usually folder level or box level inventory that identifies what's inside the boxes. And uh, so when people come to use the archives, they need to tell us if they want, if it's a tiny collection, like that's just a couple of folders, we'll bring out the whole thing. But if it's a large collection that has 30 boxes, 50 boxes, then we need them to say, I want box two, mm -hmm. I want box seven. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that helps inform them and it helps inform us. Okay. How do you t determine what should be archived? That's a good question. Um, the archives that I work in, the uh, Dallas Municipal Archives, is uh, blessed to have a records management program. And records management ensures uh, that, uh, that materials, uh, the, the records of different departments are kept only as long as they have to be legally kept, then they can be legally uh, disposed of. Mm -hmm. And at the point of disposal, uh, it goes through what you might call an appraisal process, not, not necessarily monetary appraisal, but uh, historical appraisal, uh, fiscal value to the city, uh, intrinsic value. It's cool if it has a certain signature on it, um, but also legal value and those kinds of different kinds of appraisal value, which help us determine whether it's the kind of thing that we need to get. And uh, to be perfectly honest, there's also a little bit of crystal ball involved mm -hmm. in which we try to anticipate user needs. That's okay. a nice way to say crystal ball. Okay. And what exactly can be archived? Like, could is it more than just photos and documents or could it be like actual things that can be archived? Good question. <laughs> um, I think traditionally when we think of archives, we think of paper-based materials, which is, you know, paper or photographs, like you said, but uh, we do take on artifacts, uh, three-dimensional items, which we usually tend to classify as a type of artifact. Um, we'll take them on for, you know, sentimental reasons. Mm -hmm. um, that's not, that's not very scientific, but, uh, but if they seem to have a historical value to it, so we have, uh, for instance, an old meter, uh, a parking meter in, in the, our collection. But we also have things like architectural models for the uh, bridges that are uh, going across the sea bridges, uh, sea streets right now. Mm -hmm. So, and those were not being planned to get, be kept. Okay. And so we have those for reference when someone wants to see what the, uh, the vision for the for the Trinity River and the Trinity River bridges were going to be. Okay, um, and I'm going to have you speak up just a little louder. It looks like um, sure we need some we need to speak sure. up for the mics to pick us up. Um, awesome. Well, um, I wanted to ask also, how did you get into archival work? Um, that is a real interesting story, <laughs> and um, it's fun to tell because. Um, you know, a lot of kids don't know what they're going to do with their lives for, you know, at, at different, at, at some points, and uh, a lot of people try out different jobs, but um, my first encounter with an archives was at the age of 12, when I pursued a federal grant that was a grant program for children, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't get the grant, but it did get me in the door of a place that was called the Barker Texas History Center. Uh, it is now a part of what is called the Dolph Briscoe Center for American History at the University of Texas at Austin. And I had no clue that uh, I would end up there, but uh, it's when I entered my undergraduate career at, at UT Austin, needed a job, and I was offered one as a clerical assistant in the archives at the very same place. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started there when I was, I guess, 18. And um, I have, uh, only prior to that, I had been, you know, hamburger cook and I've been a 
you know, uh, janitor and custodian and that kind of thing. So uh, work, I've only worked in an archive of some sort for since the age of 18. So wow. I'm, I'm really not any good for any other profession. <laughs> I'm sure you are, but that's fascinating. <laughs> um, okay, well, what we can do is kind of talk about those interesting stories that you've come across in your career. Um, as, I mean, obviously, specifically to Dallas. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those things that we had talked about was um, Cattletail Drives. Um, can you tell me a little more about Cattletail Drives in Dallas, if there were any? <laughs> love to talk about it. Well, as many Dallas people know, there is a lovely uh, sculpture um, on uh, Marilla slash Young Street to opposing streets that um, uh, by that's in front of the Dallas Convention Center. And uh, it's a lovely sculpture, depicts a cattle drive, a 19th century cattle drive. But uh, I'm, I've always been puzzled why we have it in Dallas because Dallas really isn't much of a cattle town. Um, there were now, there were a lot of things going on here. This is where the, this was the center of the Buffalo Hyde trade. Um, a lot of things like that were going on in Dallas, but, but uh, Dallas is really not much of a cattle town. Um, the primary reasoning is that is that the trail that goes through Dallas is part of what's called the Shawnee Trail. Mm -hmm. And it was indeed a cattle trail at some point. Actually, all the cattle trails that were used in the Old West, uh, of course, originate with um, uh, indigenous American traces. And uh, so most of those are actually Indian trails of some sort, but they've been, um, I guess, widened or enlarged um, in their use and extended uh, by future folks, but um, the, the two trails that kind of emanate from South Texas is the uh, Chisholm Trail, and uh, which runs through you know Austin and through Central Texas, North Central Texas, and then about at Waco, uh, it splits off, and from Waco, the Shawnee Trail splits off and goes up uh, north through Dallas, and then onward uh, up into Oklahoma and uh, up to uh, Kansas and uh, Missouri where the, where the markets were for all the cattle. Mm -hmm. But where most of the cattle driving really went on was through the Chisholm Trail. And Chisholm Trail splits off from Waco going up um, into, of course, Fort Worth, which is still called Cowtown. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I find it interesting that we have a, a um, cattle uh, drive um, tribute, but uh, there are only a handful of accounts of actual cattle drives going through Dallas. Mm -hmm. It's just, there, surely there were some, but uh, by around the end of the Civil War, there weren't really hardly any kind of trail driving going through this part of Texas. Mm -hmm. And you're right, yeah. I mean, Fort Worth is known as Cowtown, they still have mm -hmm. the cattle drive through through downtown Fort Worth right. every every once through in a while. Through the stockyards. Yes, yes, yeah, through the stockyards. Um, well, that's fascinating. Um, another thing that you had mentioned to me prior to this call, um, or prior to this webinar, excuse me, is that um, Dallas Dallas has more than its fair share of outlaws. Um, you know, more than just Bonnie and Clyde, yeah. and uh, which is arguably one of the most famous set of outlaws, um, I guess. In the U.S. Um, so could you tell me more about outlaws in Dallas and, you know, what, what were they known for and who could we have possibly forgotten in terms of outlaws? Right, right. Um, I find it fascinating that there are so many different instances of Old West outlaws uh, being in Dallas or hanging in Dallas, um, hanging around in Dallas. <laughs> um, but, uh, and um, there's lots and lots of myths surrounding them. And there's also a lot of reality around them. Um, for example, um, what was I thinking of, uh, well, Bell Star is a great example because Bell Star was from Missouri, but uh, was ra uh, raised in uh, the little town of Syene, which is out in the Mesquite area um, and off of uh, what's now Elam Road. 
is where the family farm was. And there's a lot of accounts of her doing um, all kinds of crazy things as, as a female bandit. But most of the banditry really occurred after she moved out of the Dallas area. But, uh, but you know, the legend endures. <laughs> um, what's fascinating about Belle Starr is she was from Missouri originally. Mm -hmm. That's also where the James gang was from James family, uh, mostly uh, Jesse James and his brother Frank. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, were among, are among pretty much the most famous uh, of the train outlaws, train robbing outlaws. And then they also operated with another set of brothers called the Youngers. Uh, that include uh, Jim Younger, Bob Younger, Cole Younger. And um, they all... Uh, much of that gang met up in a uh, very unfortunate series of events in Northfield, Minnesota, in a uh, botched raid, which really uh, was sort of the end, pretty much signaling the end of the of the uh, romantic era of bandits mm -hmm. in, in American West history, Western Midwestern history. But the uh, the James brothers. Uh, floated all over the place. So did the younger brothers. And um, Frank James liked to visit the Dallas area. And he ended up actually, after he did some prison time, when he uh, left prison, he went and worked in a dry goods store here in downtown Dallas. Oh, wow. And uh, fascinating. And what a great way to get people to come in your door <laughs> by hiring uh, a famous outlaw. His brother was Jesse James. Mm -hmm tell you everything about it um and uh, uh so frank james is one example and then frank got to know of course while they were bandits got to know cole younger quite well and cole younger also hung out in dallas quite a bit yeah. um there's not a whole lot known about his time here but there's little teasing bits of of, of information out there mm -hmm. awesome um yeah i mean uh I guess Dallas is just mainly known for having ties to Bonnie and Clyde. I mean, that is just like the biggest one. Um, but it is interesting to see all the other ties. I guess Dallas is. Oh, sure. And I should also mention other 20th century outlaws like mm -hmm. Harvey Bailey, who was one of the dean of uh, bank robbers in train, uh, not train, um, uh, safe crackers. Okay. Uh, and uh, Harvey Bailey uh, operated around this area and also throughout the Midwest. And uh, he retired to the to the Dallas area as well. Mm -hmm. And um, he, actually one of the times when he was still operating, he was uh, uh, snagged by uh, Dallas County Sheriff's Department and put in the county jail, which is you know being restored right now. And um, uh, what did he do? Uh, he, uh, it was put in what was called the escape proof jail. And uh, we have some beautiful photos in the archives of the bars that he managed to saw loose. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so uh, uh, Harvey Bailey's story is fantastic. He wrote his, lived long enough to write his autobiography and live out his days as a, as a law abiding citizen in the <laughs> Dallas area. Wonderful. Um, so let's talk about uh, City Hall. You said that you have some, some really interesting facts about City Hall. Uh, specifically that there is a mysterious third underground floor. Can you tell uh, me? Yes. <laughs> what, what is that about? The mysterious third floor. Um, city Hall is full of all kinds of, and this is the 1978 City Hall, okay. um, because of course we've had um, any number of them. Um, Dallas Morning News is right across the street from uh, the 1914 City Hall, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful building, and of course now the uh, home of the University of North Texas Law School. But uh, yeah, um, but the uh, the present Dallas City Hall has a lot of different sort of mysteries and myths and uh, rumors about its building. And uh, my favorite one has to do, and the one I get asked probably the most has to do with the uh, the purported third floor. And I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell everybody else out here, yes, there is a third floor. <laughs> it's unusable. It's unusable totally unusable because around just as soon as they were digging out the hole for it and when they started actually building it uh it uh suffered a lot of seepage and um 
groundwater coming in. And mostly because uh, if you look on old maps of, of the area that's now in the footprint of where City Hall is, you'll see that a piece of Mill Creek is running right through it. Oh, so, you know, there's water going through it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they immediately set up some some pumps um, and uh, they're still still pumping water out of it to this moment. Wow. Um, it's a lot drier than it was, but uh, you can see from the uh, sort of chalky walls in it that um, that it's had um, leaking problems uh, since day one. Wow. Um, at one point, they didn't control the water as well, and there was a certain a number amount of it standing. It actually, there was actually a little uh, dinghy or a little John boat mm -hmm. of sorts that, that people got in. But, um, but anyhow, there's also a lot of questions about what is gonna be done with the third floor. Yeah. And what most commonly asked is if it was going to be a dart station. Well, that's a good question. It's also many years before dart was created. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you could, in all fairness, say it was actually for dart because uh, it didn't exist at the time. But there was a possibility of it becoming some kind of underground transport mm. uh, station of some kind. So that is partly true. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that I found out in research is that um, the actual plan for the third floor before it became unviable was to use it as the city jail. Wow, really? Yes. <laughs> and. Um, uh, there was uh, a lot of outcry mm -hmm. about, you know, keeping things like, uh, you know, parts of municipal court there. Basically, you don't like to put jails and judges together. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can help it, it's nice to kind of keep those separate. Um, but which is why we have municipal court in one place and we have the police in the Jack Evans building now. Mm -hmm. But uh, those are a couple of the rumors, myths about City Hall. And the last one I'll tell you about that I find really fascinating is people visiting the City Hall will look uh, at the concrete walls of City Hall. City Hall is almost entirely built of poured concrete. Um, and it's fascinating. I love it. I think it's a beautiful building. Um, but it, on the Upper floors, the ground floor to seventh floor, there are uh, indentations or little holes about that big mm -hmm. that are um, about every three feet or so. And um, one person who came on a tour said, you know what those holes are? Those are the peg, where it was where the pegs were gonna go for the paneling. And the city ran out of money for the paneling. Uh, that's not quite true. There was never paneling planned for it. The IM pay and the designers and the city of Dallas loved the idea of natural concrete colors. So that's really not true. But, uh, um, but so what were the holes? Well, that's where the mold forms were put together. Oh, interesting. Because if you're molding concrete, you have to have walls yeah. or, or temporary sides that hold in the concrete mm -hmm. while it dries. Okay, so, so that's it what doesn't it actually serve a purpose or it wasn't meant for anything else other than no. for the molds. Correct. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Um, okay, so um, this is a good one, a uh, good topic, um, especially now that we're making our way through a pandemic. Um, you talk to me, or you mentioned uh, Dallas's role in public health throughout history. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and specifically um, the former health department, the city's health department and the fight against polio and other diseases. Can you go through, you know, some of the significant contributions that the health department, the city's former health department had in, in epidemics and pandemics in the past? Sure. Um, it's interesting that uh, a couple of years prior to you know, the great unpleasantness, um, we were doing a lot of research on public health. And part of it was because I knew we were coming up on the centennial mm -hmm. of, of the influenza pandemic of 1918-19, yeah. which is, wow, who could have guessed? Yeah. 
But uh, that led me to follow up on sort of the whole story of public health and, and uh, city government. And it is an, uh, an endlessly fascinating area of study. And um, uh, the city has been tackling uh, uh, epidemics as far back as the 1870s when things like yellow fever and cholera were still a big deal. And uh, there is a beautiful engraving in a uh, one of the magazines from the 1870s uh, called Harper's uh, Magazine. And it's a picture of a train uh, being stopped in outside of Dallas by a posse. Mm -hmm. And the posse was, um, I believe, led either by the mayor or what were then council members. Um, and uh, they were it was a train coming from New Orleans, which was a notorious, um, you know, vector point, I think you would call it today for, uh, for the spread of, of something like yellow fever. Uh, so that's, quarantine has been going on a long, long <laughs> time here. It's nothing new. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the city has been fighting things like meningitis outbreaks, uh, uh, polio, of course, which was a, a horrible scourge for many years. Um, Dallas was one of the first, uh, one of the test sites that were used for in the 50s for the uh, Salk vaccine uh, to combat polio. And when I give talks about, about public health, I like to bring that up and ask if anyone's in the audience, um, do you remember getting a sugar cube as a kid in school? And there are quite a few who do. Um, and uh, that was how they uh, distributed the um, polio vaccine really? for little kids uh, because anybody will eat a gobble of, you know, a sugar cube. Yeah. But uh, uh, the, the, the proof is in the pudding, so to speak. And the, the rates, uh, the graphs you can see and the reports from the health department are dramatic. Um, over a two-year period, the, the the graph goes. It took a complete nosedive until there were just you know a couple of cases right. from hundreds and hundreds of cases. So it's it's real uh, dramatic story of how um, city intervention and and uh, and education of the public uh, helped you know a nationwide crisis of, mm -hmm. of polio. And how was the city approaching, you know, let, let's say, well, let, let's take polio. How was the city approaching it and distributing this information? Was it just through like, I mean, notices or again, like through those sugar cubes, I guess? Um, they had a, a robust, um, what you would probably call social media today, okay. uh, a, a system for disseminating information mm -hmm. uh, through handouts, and leaflets, and uh, they've worked hand in hand with uh, the Dallas schools. Uh, and um, they uh, let people know through, you know, clinics, get tested, um, that kind of thing. Well, you can't get tested for polio, um, but, but I mean, um, lots of ways of getting the information out right. there. Got it. Wow. Very cool. Um, well, why don't we go ahead and, you know, move to questions. Um, okay. I'd love to see if anyone has questions. Okay. Let's see. Um, so it says here, how are the city archives different from those of the Dallas Historical Society and or regarding the Kennedy assassination and the sixth floor museum? Great question. And thank you for asking. Um, the way I like to look at the Dallas Municipal Archives is that it is uh, a governmental entity. And so what we primarily collect are the records of Dallas city government. So you think about that in terms of city departments like police or fire or uh, transportation or sanitation. So that's really kind of how uh, you would look for things in our archives. But when someone says like, well, do you have pictures of Jerry Jones and the Dallas Cowboys? No, we really don't collect that because that's not a function of the city. Mm -hmm. So you need to kind of think along the lines of what it, of, of city government. Um, the, uh, our, uh, 
our colleagues across the street from us at the Dallas Public Library on the seventh floor, who have wonderful collections, by the way, um, are have mostly collections that relate, I think, to the more, most more to what I would call the social history of the of the city. They have the uh, records of private citizens. They have the records of businesses and things like that. So I like to think that we kind of complement each other. Um, there's the governmental history, there's the social history, uh, business history, and then uh, as far as its difference from the uh, uh, county uh, or the Dallas Historical Society is Dallas Historical Society uh, was is a not as organic, I guess I would say. Uh, there are wonderful collections here, but they span uh, a great deal of history and uh, a lot of it is more of, of the social nature. Um, they have uh, records of pioneer citizens. They have all kinds of wonderful artifacts and things there. Um, and uh, I think they have a smidgen of records from Dallas County. And by the way, Dallas County does not have an archives program, which is a shame. Okay. <laughs> but, but they do have wonderful materials in the uh, county clerk's office and in what was the uh, county records building. Um, if someone wanted to access city archives, how would they do that? Uh, we are open by appointment Monday through Thursday. And uh, if you go to uh, Dow, you can contact us at um, NSPOL archives. Uh, at dallascityhall.com. I believe that is uh, our, our uh, email address. Or you can just go to dallascityhall.com and uh, look for us under the under our parent department, which is the city secretary's office. Wonderful. Um, so we've got another question here. What is the oldest item in the archive? Ah, <laughs> oldest item in the archives is probably uh, the earliest records of the Dallas City Council, which then was actually a board of aldermen. And uh, that's from 1866. Wow. Um, the first 10 years of city government, 18, from 1856 to 1866, don't exist. Oh, uh, we think that it was probably wiped out in the 1860 fire, or also probably through negligence, also through the uh, fact that there was not a permanent city hall until later in its life. Mm -hmm. So, and you know what happens when people put stuff in boxes and they move, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you lose a little bit along the way. Right. Got it. Cool. Um, okay. So, um, so we've already answered one question on the archives open for research to citizens. Actually, I mean, I guess that would be kind of a different version of the question, but Yes. Are they, they are okay <laughs> absolutely um, we're happy to take appointments and uh, we encourage you uh, i mentioned earlier our collection inventories those are online about uh, about 50 percent of our collections have are described and have inventories mm -hmm. uh, you can let us know what you want to see and we'll be happy to bring them out for you um okay and then um so we have another question that is let's see so we'll, uh, Okay, so yeah, this this question um, is about streets, and it is kind of hard to answer in terms of you know we it's hard to do the research ahead of time or during the webinar. Um, but um, we'll see if we can grab this question and get back to you later if that's if that's all right. Um, I think we have another question here. So, does your archive include, for example, information on marches, protests? and the like to which there would have been a police or official city response? Uh, wonderful question. Um, uh, we decided the um, assistant city archivist and myself um, decided um, on, uh, several years ago, uh, particularly in the wake of George Floyd protests and things like that, that um, it would behoove us to start documenting uh, protests and uh, social movements that occur, uh, particularly on city property. So uh, we are actively collecting um, photography primarily, but also uh, things like literature and things that document um, protest and uh, uh, 
uh, descent uh, that occurs uh, mostly in the area of City Hall mm -hmm. um, because it, it really does um, tell a whole nother side of the story. Um, and um, because, you know, in the newspaper, they'll say there was a protest outside of City Hall. Mm -hmm. Well, the city's, um, you know, uh, some total uh, experience with it primarily is, is, you know, they issue a permit for people to do their parades or their, or marches or whatever. And, uh, and also uh, provide, you know, police um, um, activity there. And um, that's sort of the officials, I guess, city uh, response to things. But uh, we, especially when during the uh, Occupy movement, when the camp was set up behind City Hall, uh, I went and took a lot of photographs there because I realized this was sort of a special moment uh, in American history and, and also in Dallas history. And uh, also, you know, realized that people are going to ask later, you know, do you have pictures of, of George Floyd protests? Do you have pictures of um, the student walkout that occurred several years ago mm -hmm. that included a, um, the, students uh, walk out from school and they actually came into City Hall and, and um, kind of not really occupied, but they were in City Hall for mm -hmm. a couple of hours. Okay. Um, let's see. Tell about the Friends of the Archives. Friends of the Archives. Ah, what is that? <laughs> the Friends of the Dallas Municipal Archives is a 501c nonprofit that is was established uh, several years ago to um, help out the municipal archives to do things that it can't normally do with its existing budget. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Friends is um, actively seeking members and um, I'm sure that they would be happy to uh, tell you about it. I believe you can Google them and find them on the internet. Uh, uh, I am not a well, I'm uh, involved with it, but I am not a, a voting member of it since it, it benefits the archives, but it does things like it helps us acquire collections, uh, acquire equipment um, and uh, supplies like the, all those wonderful boxes and folders and mylar sleeves and things that help uh, protect and care for our materials. Wonderful, cool. Okay. Let's see. So I don't know if we can answer this one. So it says, at one point, it was possible to visit the 1947 City Hall where Oswald was held and individuals visit there. I don't know if we can answer this. I'll have to look for it um, unless you can answer it, John. Um, I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, I do know that uh, at the point that the old City Hall and its annex, which I think the person's referring to where the uh, part of the city, well, actually the, the jail part is in the 1914 building, um, uh, that because the building was being restored uh, to several different time periods, mm -hmm. so the front of the building has to be, had, was required to be restored to 1914, or at least to the exterior look of it. And similarly, the 1950s, uh, annex in the back was required to look like it did when it opened in the 50s. Mm -hmm. um, so at least cosmetically. Um, so that left the, uh, the, the old cells, including the one that Oswald uh, was in. And uh, they had to find a compromise between um, getting rid of them and, uh, pres and preserving uh, a spot of history. So most of the jail cell blocks most of the blocks were removed, and uh, um, but they retained the, the block that uh, that held Oswald. And I don't know what uh, University of North Texas is planning to do, but there was at one point a plan to be able to take people through it. Mm -hmm. So maybe contact UNT. Great. Um, so it looks like those are all the questions that we have. Um, John, was there anything else that you wanted to mention? Anything else that you wanted to talk about? Uh, during this webinar today? Let me think. <laughs> um, I will make a plea to our read, uh, to readers and viewers that archives is something that's in your midst. Um, 
you know, uh, some people don't think that their family history has any value or it's very interesting, but uh, I like to think otherwise. And there is really, uh, there are great stories that are in everyone's family papers. So do what you can to protect them. Um, keep them out of harsh light. Uh, keep them away from fluctuating temperatures if you can. That's kind of hard. Mm -hmm. But um, keeping them uh, dry and keeping them out of places where they could uh, uh, attract moisture, places where they could attract uh, bugs and other beasties that will eat, eat paper, uh, love paper. Um, the, the little things that you can do will help uh, preserve your materials for uh, future family and uh, other generations. But um, uh, I also like to think that there are things of interest to the city that are still out there. If you ever find an old city directory uh, or a uh, city hall directory, or if you find things like a city hall budget, uh, or city hall publications. We're always interested in that kind of thing, uh, particularly interested in the history of the city's transit system, which was once operated by the city. And then we got out of the, the trolley system in the 50s. And then uh, we got out of the bus system in, uh, in the early 70s. And then we, of course, uh, threw in our lot with our with all of our neighbors in the North Texas area to create DART. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of transportation history that I think uh, is probably sitting in people's houses and homes. And we just recently were given a, uh, a transit token uh, that we would have used on one of the uh, trolleys. Oh, how wonderful. And uh, that's a nice reminder of what, what transportation used to be like in Dallas. Awesome. Well, Everyone just take a look through your house and see if you can find anything. And if, once you find it, you know who to contact. Um, but John, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and of course, to our viewers and our subscribers, thank you for joining us as well. Um, and we will see you next time.